also i believe yes yes the hot chocolate yeah. among other things yes yeah okay friends so uh, we're going to start now uh, so by chanting namo tassa and the three refuges for those who like namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang saranang gacchami, Dhammang saranang gacchami, Sangang saranang gacchami, Duti ampi buddhang saranang gacchami, Duti ampi dhammang saranang gacchami, Duti ampi sangang saranang gacchami Tati ampi buddhang saranang gacchami Tati ampi dhammang saranang gacchami Tati ampi sangang saranang gacchami So friends, uh, welcome to this Sunday afternoon uh, talk and, uh, and meditation. Uh, today we are, oh, last uh, week, a couple of weeks, we started uh, going over some Dhammapada uh, verses and uh, looking at uh, some of the stories connected with the, uh, the verses. And so today we want to continue with that. I'm not necessarily going to cover all of uh, the verses, but the ones that I, I feel are, are useful uh, for most uh, you know, people, especially lay people. Uh, so, so far we've covered the, the first uh, five verses of the Dhammapada in the Yamakavaga, the uh, twin verses. Uh, and so this verse number six, I'm going to uh, chant uh, the Pali and then uh, give the English uh, translation. Parechana vijananti maya metayamamasi yechatata vijananti tato samanti medaga. Others know not that in this quarrel we perish. Those, of, those who realize it have their quarrels calmed thereby. So this verse is very <laughs> pertinent because quarrels amongst people, whether they're family members or quarrels just amongst society at large, uh, are what stir up uh, so much ill will and animosity amongst people. And quarrels are usually people that are clinging to their opinions, right? So you have an opinion, you state it, the other person says, well, I don't think so, you know, I think it's like that, or, or you know, that, that person's crazy. Or, and, uh, and so people get in arguments, in quarrels, uh, trying to defeat the other person or to assert their opinion uh, over the other person. And we can see that very much in politics, <laughs> even the current situation of politics. Not only that, even this COVID epidemic, right? People are quarreling over whether they should wear masks or they shouldn't wear masks, or uh, they should observe, should open their uh, establishments or, or keep them closed and so on, or travel restrictions. So, you know, it's, it's the quarrels and, and basically it comes from clinging, 
clinging to our particular idea uh, of what is right or wrong. And naturally everybody assumes or thinks that their opinion is right. And you know, corals cover the whole gamut. You know, parents have corals over to how to, how to raise their children, right? Or, uh, the children quarrel with the parents about what they want to do or what they shouldn't do. And parents quarrel with the, the children and uh, friends quarrel with friends. So it's a very pertinent uh, verse. And most of these quarrels in the bigger picture are kind of you know insignificant or they're sometimes very petty or trivial uh, and that shows you how strong our clinging to opinions are and opinions are simply our conditioning of, of the past or what appeals to our whims or our fancies that we cling to them and naturally we try to we will defend that uh, when anybody criticizes that or challenges it, us uh, in some way or another you know core people quarrel about quarrel about politics they quarrel about even about religions they quarrel about you know even you know sometimes uh, well, the Buddha didn't teach rebirth, or, or yes, he did. And, you know, they try to find out reasons and give reasons why, you know, to, to support some view that they, they have. Uh, even to the point of sometimes ignoring sort of pretty basic facts. Anyway, so, uh, and then there's a story that is given for this verse. So there was a group of monks living in uh, Kosambi uh, in the time of the Buddha. And they were uh, quarreling over some uh, Vinaya rules, some monastic rules. So some of the monks were very strict and they were interpreting, uh, you know, some of the rules the Buddha laid down in a, uh, a certain way and other monks were quarreling saying, oh, well, he didn't mean that, or, you know, I don't think it's like this, you know, it's not that severe, it's not a big deal. And the other one saying, well, yes, it is. And, and so anyway, uh, you know, and they called the Buddha to intervene and, you know, to give the Buddha's opinion, right? But even the Buddha, even though the Buddha may give, give his opinion, the monks still didn't want to accept it. You know, and uh, didn't listen even to the Buddha. So in, <clears throat> in the end, the Buddha gave up. And he said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, basically, you know, I don't want to hear this anymore. And so he went out to the forest and he spent, the, this was just before the rainy season. So he decided, okay, I'm going to spend the rainy season out, uh, you know, in a remote uh, location. And I don't want anybody coming here except uh, somebody who might be bringing uh, the food. In the end, monkeys and elephants were actually bringing the Buddha fruit and uh, things like that. But then, but then the monks felt so bad that they were quarreling to the extent that they even drove the Buddha away. I mean, you know, they became monks under the Buddha to follow his teachings, and then they they were they became so ashamed of having driven the Buddha away, the Buddha away that uh, that they felt about it. So, and the laity also were blaming the monks. Look at, you quarrel some monks. You sent the Buddha away. We wanted to see the Buddha for these three months. We wanted to come and listen to his Buddha talks, Dhamma talks. And, and, and now you, you quarrel some guys have blown it, you know? And, now, and so they, they, they were even like, just maybe stop giving them food or threaten to stop giving them food. So it took that for finally the, the Buddha, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, uh, invited the Buddha back and they apologized and uh, uh, they brought the Buddha back, uh, you know, after the, the three months of Asa. And uh, finally they stopped their quarreling, uh, at least, uh, over that particular incident and for some uh, time.
but you know, it probably happened uh, again later on or with different monks or with different uh, things. So anyway, the Buddha then uh, recited that verse. So usually all these verses were, came, you know, they, they spontaneously came to the Buddha based on uh, some incidents that uh, happened. Um, so, you know, the, the main point in this, uh, that verse was, it's about, you know, clinging to our uh, opinions. And there's always going to be people who have differing uh, opinions, just about for anything you could possibly imagine. Look, at there, you know, every, everything that comes up in life, you can see it, you know, Supreme Court cases, issues that no one will agree absolutely on, on everything. Uh, and that's why you have you know, so many split factions. And a lot of that is due to past karma and past experiences. And so that's one of the teachings is to understand that. that the, it comes back to the first verse about mano pubanga madhamma that the mind is the forerunner of all conditions. And so, and, and clinging is what, uh, you know, is a major factor in the, in the mind creating these uh, conditions. Uh, they're just reactions to the, the way we've been uh, trained and brought up and to use, you know, program really uh, to believe, you know, these different, uh, Thing. So therefore, in meditation, it's an important thing to, to uh, recognize when you're clinging. And if, you, if you're in the midst of a quarrel, or before you start a, a conversation with somebody, you should be aware of the potential for quarreling, especially if you know the person. And if you uh, then in the middle of the co co when you catch yourself actually quarreling, you should reflect on that and uh, maybe just kind of back off and, you know, let the person just, uh, you know, let off his steam and try not to rebut them uh, too much uh, in order to, you know, keep the peace, so to speak. Uh, so, or even if you, even after you've done speaking, if you really, oh, that was a stupid argument, uh, you know, you know, reflect on that and try to be more mindful uh, next time you speak. That's why the, the awareness of intention, uh, you know, before you speak, to understand why am I going to speak this? Is it to defeat the other person in an argument or assert my views? Even if they, they may be actually factually right and so on, still uh, there's going to be people who dis uh, disagree. Sometimes it may be healthy to get into some, you know, discussions like that, but still they lead to ill will and, and uh, simmering, you know, resentment by the others who maybe got, uh, you know, humiliated or uh, <laughs> defeated in some uh, arguments. And we can see that. And uh, so, and, and those can even spill over to subsequent lifetimes also. Uh, that people are a quarrel in this life. If you haven't settled your quarrels in this life, that quarrel may come again in the next life, in in some other way. And there are, uh, you know, a lot of Jataka stories, uh, which, uh, and also the Dhammapada verses that are based on these kind of things. Now, let's go on to the next uh, two verses. Uh, so I'm going to uh, chant these verses also in Pali. Subha nupasing viharantam indriyesu asambuttam bojanam hi amatanyum kusitam hinaviryam tamve prasahati maro vato rukam vadubalam And then the opposite, asubha nupasing viharantam Indriyesu asusamvat guttam bojanam hi chamatanyum saddam aradaviryam tam vena napasat. 
na pasahati na maro vato selam vapabhatam. So to translate those, uh, whoever lives contemplating pleasant things or the, the, the you know, beautiful marks and pleasant things with senses unrestrained, in food, immoderate in food, with uh, an indolent or lazy, inactive, without faith, him verily Mara overthrows as the wind overthrows a weak tree. So we can see in storms, when winds come up, some trees don't blow down, other, other trees <laughs> blow down because their weeks, their roots are weak or their branches are not strong enough to resist the wind. So we see the same thing in human beings also. Uh, uh, and some easily get overthrown and destroyed by immoderation and by overindulgence, whether it's overindulgence in food, in, in drugs, in other unwholesome habits. And they, they, you know, they wind up wreaking havoc, even death and deadly pain and uh, breaking up uh, families and so on. And then the opposite, whoever lives contemplating the impurities with senses restrained, moderate in eating, full of faith, full of energy, that person, Mara, does not overthrow, just as the wind does not turn over a rocky mountain. So a big rocky mountain, you know, the winds don't blow over a rocky mountain because they're, they're very uh, heavy and grounded deep in the, in the earth. So in the same way when uh, our senses are restrained and in practicing the middle path and moderation and everything, then uh, we don't get overwhelmed by the, you know, the impermanence uh, and, and so on that's constantly going on in our bodies and minds. So this is ba basically, you know, about uh, having mindfulness and practicing the sensory restraint Indriya Sambhara and not letting the uh, and contemplating the not seeing the you know the marks of beauty but instead seeing the impermanence of those supposedly beautiful marks you know see the beautiful color or smell or shape of certain objects, whether it's people or other things or food. And we don't know that that's just very superficial and those things could change. And so that desire comes. So there's some stories about this also. Uh, so there were two brothers, it seems, that have become monks. And the older one became a monk out of conviction. You probably heard some talks about the Buddha and, and uh, said, wow, you know, that's, you know I, I want to really become a monk, you know. And so, but the other one became a monk without any faith. Maybe he says, well, my brother's becoming a monk, you know, maybe I, maybe I ought to do it too or something, but he didn't really have that uh, faith or conviction. And so the younger monk who didn't have the faith was constantly thinking about material pleasures. Every time he saw, let's say, a, you know, a girl or, or something, he would, you know, only see her, you know, hair or creamy skin or whatever, or hear a voice and then desire would, you know, arise in his mind, or he'd be thinking about the food and the other kind of desires because he didn't meditate, you know, he didn't have faith in the Buddha and he was just using the monk's life as what he figured was a way just to get free food and, uh, you know, kind of a, an easy life. But uh, 
So, but anyways, eventually he succumbed to the temptations because of course, as a monk, you're limited by certain rules. And if you break the rules, you'll be criticized by other monks. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, most people would wind up disrobing. So this monk disrobed and went back to his former wives. But the older monk, the one who became a monk out of devotion and faith, he strived hard and he attained arhatship. So, you know, liberation from all the defilements. And his former wives tried to trap him. You know, just, uh, and, but they failed because his mind was liberated from the taints of sensual pleasure and all kinds of it, those attachments. And he was constantly, his mind was constantly, you know, understanding the illusory nature of beauty and contemplating the impurity. So they, they couldn't tempt him. Uh, and so that's the meaning of uh, the verse. And <clears throat> That's why the, when, you, when you become a, a monastic, of course, this might have been talking about these uh, you know, two monks, but even in our, for lay people, the, the same applies. If you're always just thinking about the, the sensual amusement and, and so on, the mind will constantly be becoming uh, trapped and lured and uh, then you know, all kinds of pains and problems arise from that. Uh, but but and when medit people start meditating, whether you're a monk or a lay person, even the same thing happens. Even the lay people that want to meditate, they, but they don't have the rules that monks do, so they're even challenged more. Because at least monks have certain rules that uh, give them some uh, strength to uh, try to follow. Where a lay person not having the same rules, they have to exert the double. Uh, uh, discipline not to let's say eat in the evening for example or to uh, you know have some conversation with you know women or, or whatever and and so on so uh, and so it's a it's a teaching on the power of the in the allure of the senses and if we uh, are unmindful and we get uh, we get caught on the marks of of beauty without uh, contemplating the, uh, the dangers in that, and then we get uh, overthrown and uh, have problems that arise from that. So these are the, the, the verses that I wanted to uh, go over today. And <clears throat> so now I would like to open it up to some uh, questions, if you have any questions or points of discussion about uh, these uh, these verses, then you can write them down on the, the chat, or I guess what you want to unmute them, or, or you can unmute yourself and uh, you can ask uh, your question. So Bhante, maybe I will ask a question. <clears throat> yes. Um, so if you are having a discussion about, uh, let's say about anything with anybody like family or friends or anyone, and 
you do think that you are right and the other person is not. Uh, and even then, in order to not to have the argument or the fight or um, the negative things which follow when whenever one is in a discussion like that, do you think in order to avoid uh, that unpleasantness, one should just give in and 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 not continue to prove one's point even if one is right? Well, that, that would depend on the situation and on the person. You know, if you know that person is always quarreling and will, will not let go of his views or will not uh, even uh, want to listen to anything you said, then it's kind of a, you know, a dead end street. But if it's somebody you perhaps don't know and, uh, you know, you can test uh, the waters and you can present a point of view, but not to the saying this is the absolute truth and you have to believe this say well uh, this is what uh, that i understand from uh, these teachings and uh, but uh, for those who want to follow it then fine and others who don't want to then that's that's also their prerogative and we have to understand the other person's point of view and that not everybody is going to especially let's say in terms of the dhamma not everyone is is ready to accept the, the teachings even though we you know feel that they are the the truth so not to you know push a person's buttons uh, too much on it and maybe just uh you know don't try to push the conversation too much if you understand that person is coming from this kind of a belligerent point of view and doesn't want to entertain any sort of alternatives then uh you know, don't uh, necessarily kind of push their buttons by, you know, retorting back too strongly and so on. And say, well, uh, you know, okay, you can believe what you, you believe and, uh, you know, I'll follow what I believe and, and uh, you know, try not to, you know, let it escalate into some unpleasant thing. Uh, you know, usually when, when a family's come together for holidays, there's uh, three things that are usually considered to be, you know, taboo, like don't go there, you know, uh, money, religion, and politics, right? Because yes. those are the same, <laughs> those are the things that people will, will get into arguments about uh, every time, you know. So usually uh, people will stick to, oh, how's your children this week? <laughs> or how was your holiday here? Yes, just the superficial conversation rather than getting into... Um, right. Yeah. Is, of course, if somebody asks you a question, you say, well, I heard you, I, I heard you practicing meditation, you know, or, you know, or, you know, can you tell me something about that? And then if they start to say, well, uh, you know, I, you know, I believe in God. I think, you know, people have to believe in Jesus. And you say, well, if you believe that, that's fine, you know. Uh, but don't say, no, you shouldn't or anything. Okay, that's fine for you. But uh, for people that uh, want to hear about the Dhamma and meditation, it's there. For those that don't, that's their, their karmic problem. And maybe they'll get ready to do it later on. I mean, we can suggest some things, but if they're not willing to, you know, if they're really close-minded, then, uh, you know, don't uh, try to, you know, convince them at that point in time. There'll be a, another time when they may be ready, you know. Yeah, but especially I've seen that in the name of religion, uh, I mean, there have been very serious fights. People um, proving, you know, that their own religion is is much better and the other person's is not. And uh, I mean that that has led to so many wars. Actually, you know, not not just <laughs> not not just you know light discussions or light fights, but it it does it has. If you look back in the history, it has led a name of religion. People have really destroyed. Uh, it's a lot of destruction. Even to the current day, people are being killed for talking about you know other. <laughs> religions or leaders in a bad way you know that people get offended right. and they'll take to 
serious things, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we have to understand the sensitive others and not provoke them also, you know. Just right. to prove our point of, you know, everybody should be liberal and we should be able to talk about anything we want. No, the Buddha didn't encourage that either, you know. He said, if something's true and the time is not right, don't say it. You know, so uh, or if something is true and the time is right, then use your discretion. So he was very particular about also, you know, not, uh, you know, trying to always assert the truth or opinions if it's considering the time and the person that you are talking with. Yes, Monty. Thank you. Because my, my sister and I, we had, my sister was a kind of a born again Christian. And, and I, when I first became a monk and, you know, she thought I was, you know, really going down the wrong path. And, uh, and we got together, uh, we followed that. Don't talk about, don't talk about this, you know. Right. Stay out of trouble. Just talking about, you know, how's mom? Well, she's doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> how's your kids? <laughs> Yes. I was like, well, yeah, I went trekking in the Himalayas. It was pretty nice. You know? <laughs> oh. Yeah, but they, this happens in the families all the time. Like, you know, my family was here this weekend. And uh, sometimes uh, children are very headstrong, <laughs> you know. Um, so there comes a point when, um, as an older person of the family, you wonder whether you should just... Um, give in to them even if they are wrong or you should <laughs> you know it becomes a kind of a you don't know what to do at that point you know because uh, they are uh, they want to prove their point they are aggressive and uh, very vocal and so so it becomes a one doesn't really know in situations like that how how do you keep the peace of the family as well as uh, get your point across you know, it, it uh, takes a lot of skill and trial and error. We're all going to make mistakes in, in things like that. But uh, when you get when you know the other person a little bit and you know the way that they what they believe and how they react, then you, you don't deliberately try to push their buttons, you know, especially if you want to maintain some harmony or, you know, in the house. <laughs> yes. Or if there are kids around, you know, not to get into loud, raucous arguments because that will, you know, affect the, the kids' minds and all that too. Anybody else out there have any uh, questions? Kuanjin, Namaste, Bante. It's Bikam. Oh, hi, Bikam. Hi. Continuing with Rokus in the house, um, the subject, I just. Um, so I noticed in myself, and uh, my daughter doesn't do something I like her to do, I get very upset. Um, and uh, I react really not in skillful ways. And so, and, and it's kind of escalates. So basically anger, you know, what I'm talking about, strong emotions, anger. And uh, so, What are your suggestions? I was thinking maybe I should just leave the situation and just go for a walk or something because it doesn't help. Sometimes that might be the right, uh, the right uh, you know, solution or <laughs> the right thing to do at that time. Uh, as I said, if the, you know, the other person is... Uh, Obstinate. Although we also have to, have to check our motivation. Is this what I'm asking her to do? Is it something that's really important? You know, I'm, like picking up her clothes if she leaves her socks laying around or whatever else, or 
does it clean up? I mean, yeah, there, these things are annoying, but they're not like, you know, and, uh, you know, like <laughs> life or death situations or is, uh, you know, it's just that we have our opinions of, you know, cleanliness or orderliness, or, you know, maybe you were, you had that conditioning maybe from a younger age too, where you were told to do a lot of things. And sometimes these habits come over and we then pass them on to our, uh, you know, in our character uh, too. So we have to, you know, try to examine our mo motives for, you know, why are we going to tell them this? Is it really important? Especially if you know that they're not, they're not going to accept it. And, uh, and you know, if it, it comes to that point where, you know, the child starts yelling or something like that, then, uh, you know, like the Buddha did, you know, he, he left the, the situation. And uh, because when people are angry, that's not a good time to try to discuss. But you have to calm down first. You know, two people, when they're angry at each other, it's impossible. They'll never come to any agreement. That's why you have to pause, you have to take a few deep breaths and the other person hopefully as well. And try to relax uh, your, your body and mind and hopefully when you both calm down a bit, then maybe then try to have a, a sensible uh, you know, conversation about this. And there's trainings involved, you know, there's nonviolent communication training which can be useful and different trainings about how to to speak with people and to communicate in what are called nonviolent ways. That means using rough, aggressive language and things like that, uh, which is you know, so prevalent in uh, this society. So, you know, you might investigate some of that if, you know, just the practice of mindfulness doesn't work. Sometimes these other sort of new age trainings, you know, like uh, that, uh, you know, there's different ones out there. I can't remember them all, but uh, you know, some of them can be useful. We had a nice bonfire last night, by the way, Beacom. <laughs> Bonte, can I have a question? Uh, uh, yes. So, if you are like a, if it is in a workplace, but not in the family, and there's argument, uh, not from a religion point of view, but more like a people who has a very strong eye and then keep on their views. Um, and you know that, and then they are also from other religion, other faith like the Jehovah Witness or the Church of the Seven Adventists. So if you have uh, those, should, and they, we can see that they have a strong personality and then they say, my view is right like for their work or something. And we saw that, sh and then that is wrong. Should I just keep it silent? And, or should I tell them my views? And then if it is, if we keep it silent, it's almost like we get over, step on like that. Yes. Uh, again, it, it depends on what the situation uh, was. Uh, and, you know, of course, if it's something to do with work and, you know, th that your, your answer or your, uh, you know, is going to affect whatever your job performance or something like that, then you might have to try to, you know, defend your, your viewpoints, so to speak, or defend yourself of, Somebody's, you know, maybe telling untruths about your performance or uh, something else. Uh, uh, so sometimes we we need to uh, speak up, not let people walk over us, because that's what people will do uh, if you don't. But we have to do it in a non-angry way. And we have to do it in a way that uh, is firm, but yet gentle at the same time. And it's not always easy, especially because these emotions come up so quickly, you know, our, our reactions. So, you know, every situation is different. So there's no blanket way necessarily that's going to work in every, 
every situation. Uh, so like it's just if anger comes up, then we should like if there's anger, then you, you have to be then mindful. You know that we should stop at that time. Take a deep, slow breath. Know that you're starting to get angry and say, okay, relax. And, you know, whatever I'm going to speak, let me try to do it in a, in a non-angry uh, or aggressive way, especially using any unskillful language. Uh, and, uh, and then see where it goes from there, you know? Because the other person will react with more aggression. If you act with a little aggression, the other person is going to re react with more. And then that, then if you don't have mindfulness, that will trigger off even more in yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Okay, there's something in the chat box. It says, uh, could you please give more instruction on how to develop energy? I find that with old age and sickness, my levels of physical and mental energy are much lesser than before. Well, there are, there are two kinds of energy. Right? One is physical energy, like you know, the effort to get up earlier in, in the morning if, if that's what's needed in order to have time to meditate, or the energy to, to do what is uh, uh, needful, you know, uh, so there's physical energy and then there's mental energy. You might not have a, a lot of physical energy, but uh, the mind could still have a lot of energy. Uh, that means energy to think clearly and uh, hopefully even to, to meditate. Of course, the body affects the mind and the mind affects the body. So the body's low in energy, then the thought of you know sitting sort of straight for an hour or, or a period of time, uh, even that might, you know, might not be able to, and you wind up just sort of, you know, slouching off uh, during your uh, meditation. So, uh, especially with the growing older, that uh, having less um, physical energy, uh, you know, is, is a problem, but uh, that's why doing some exercise like uh, yoga can help uh, or some other type of uh, exercises that are not that strenuous, but, you know, they take a little effort, but not necessarily that much, but they can help to uh, unlock, you know, our, our trapped energy so that energy then becomes more available. So our energy gets trapped even by our emotions. You know, you know like people in a depression, right? They, they, they have no energy because their mind is blocking that energy. It's not the, the, the physical body itself doesn't have the energy. It's the mind that's blocking the energy in the body from uh, functioning. So, uh, you know, that's why we have to keep working on balancing both the, the body and, and, and the mind. And, and the mind in the end is the greater one because mano pubanga madam. The mind is the forerunner of all conditions and the body is one of those conditions too. So, uh, uh, but you know, there's plenty of people that are reach old age and still have quite a, uh, you know, a lot of energy, uh, you know, to a certain point, uh, but at a certain point that becomes a reality. But it doesn't have to affect the mind so much. Even the Buddha, he was nearly 80 years old and you know, he couldn't really walk long distances like he used to be before and his body would get very tired. But he told the monks, this mind is so clear. I, I could take two or three, I, there could be a group of 20 monks and two at a time would ask me questions for two or three hours. And then they would like a tag team, they would go and they would get tired of asking questions and hearing the Buddha's replies. And they would go through, you know, a whole group of monks and the Buddha still wouldn't be tired. You know, his mind would be so lucent and he would never repeat the same thing twice because his mind knew, you know, hundreds of different ways of 
talking about the same things or, or different things. His mind was so clear and lucid and had that energy, even though his body still couldn't do a lot. So, of course, that's the Buddha, right? But that's an example of, you know, the mind being free from this uh, sloth and torpor. So sloth and torpor, of course, is one of the hindrances. And the, the mind is what a hindrance is the body too. So that's why if you meditate, hopefully you will you'll get more energy. And then that energy then will get you to do the things that will try to maintain the energy. You can also, you know, think about your diet and things like that and getting the proper nutrition and so on. So there's many things that may be affecting that. Uh, another chat question. I struggle with self-consciousness in all areas of my life. How do I get over this harmful habit? Well, by contemplating no self. Uh, yeah, that's true that the self dominates every single thought and action that comes up. Maybe not in gross, obvious ways, but it's that underlying sense of I that motivates everything. Uh, and, and people, you know, they're identifying with. So the whole, you could say almost the whole teaching of the Buddha is oriented toward uh, seeing these five aggregates of body, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, which covers a whole gamut of every single thing you could possibly experience in the realm of body and mind, uh, as this is not me, not mine, not myself. I mean, we've repeated these instructions hundreds and hundreds of times. And uh, people still are, you know, find it hard to overcome it. And that's because just talking about it is not enough. It's the things that keep feeding the sense of I that we have to pay attention to. And those are clinging to our opinions, our ideas, our opinions, and uh, identification with our feelings. Saying, you know, I'm feeling bad now. So every time you say, I'm feeling bad, or I don't want to do this, you, you're reinforcing the sense of I. You can say, okay, there's this thought in the mind that, uh, you know, doesn't want to do something. You know, who's the owner of this thought? You know, how did this thought arise? And you have to examine it and scrutinize it. That's part of this examination of Dhamma, investigation of Dhamma, and scrutiny of Dhamma. Uh, that uh, anything that is causing us a, a problem that comes up, we have to uh, analyze it and scrutinize it. But using the Dhamma as our uh, framework for that sc uh, scrutiny. Uh, and while you're doing that, uh, then it, you know things can change in uh, your mind. But you, you know, you know, it may not happen just doing it a couple of times. But and so that's why both mindfulness and wisdom always have to go hand in hand. First, you have to be mindful when that particular thought or emotion is arising. Then you have to examine it. You know, what is this thought of I, me, mine? Those are the, th the three, the trinity of the ego is I, me, and mine. Every time you use it, it's a little bit different. Usually, I, I like this or I like that. I'm going here, I'm going there. Then me, look at me, give it to me. Or mine. So we have three different chances to analyze this. Why do you call that mine? Well, just because you paid $10 for something, you call it yours. Well, where did you get that money? 
uh, or anyway, the, the, you can break it down in so many ways, but that, uh, that investigation of Dhamma and, and understanding that all of our thoughts and opinions and everything are just accumulation of habits and uh, we keep strengthening, re-strengthening them all the time. And we have to stop re-strengthening them by understanding what strengthens them and what weakens uh, them. And that's, you know, that's about all I can say about it. There's no magic pill that's going to make that happen. Uh, and, uh, you know, but the ego fights back. That's the thing. It struggles. It's trying to protect its delusions. And so when you threaten the ego, it fights back in that way. And it takes a lot of courage and a lot of strength and a lot of mindfulness and wisdom. What's called defeating Mara. You know, that's Mara in the mind. And, you know, Mara is very strong. And so it takes a strong medicine to overcome Mara. That's why the, the whole practice of the Vipassana meditation is the strong medicine to defeat Mara. Regarding form, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, as this is not me, not mine, not myself. Um, and it's only going to become overcome that when you attain stream entry and you actually realize, oh my. The ego is an illusion. Oh, wow. You know, when you experience that, it's like, you know, out of this world, you know, it's like something wow, you know, uh, when you actually get that experience that the ego is definitely an illusion and it's the source of all suffering. When you get that insight, that's stream entry. And, uh, and it makes it much easier to deal with it. But again, you know, people are different. And but everybody's going to take a different amount of time to develop the spiritual faculties and other things necessary to to create those conditions for it to happen. And it's not the I that's making those conditions. I mean, it's the conditioned I, but ultimately it's the truth wanting to, you know, go back to itself, so to speak that uh, helps you out. Okay. I know it's difficult, friends, and, you know, but there's, there's no other way, you know. There's no other way. That's why it's easier to just believe in a savior and hope everything's going to be okay. And, you know, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But uh, according to the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Dhamma is the only savior. Is the Dhamma. Only you can save yourself. We've made ourselves, created our prison, and we have to get out of it uh, by ourself, our conditioned self. Bhante, has there ever been a retreat on no self? All of my retreats are about no self. <laughs> just as a main topic, so one just focuses on that alone. Well, you can't just focus on on alone because you have to focus on the things that create the self. And you have to understand how the things that create the self are impermanent. Only then can you understand how the self is impermanent. That's why usually the topic of no self is, is not uh, taught in the beginning because it's it's Difficult to capture. It's almost impossible for the average person to understand it. First, you start with this body is not myself. You know, you can understand that. You didn't ask for it to come; it came. And when it dies, you can't control it. You know? And uh, so you can't control what this body does. It's easier to control what your mind thinks than what's going to happen to the body. Uh, so. It's really easy to understand how the body is not so. But once you understand that, it's a little bit easier to understand how your feelings are not so, and how your perceptions are not so, and then how your mental formations are not so. And then finally, how the consciousness is not so. That's why in the five aggregates, 
the consciousness is the last one of those to be contemplated really in term because they they progress in that order it's it's uh, material vibrations uh, feelings perceptions volitional formations and then uh, the consciousness as the knower And you know all the meditations are about the, those five uh, aggregates. And the Thanksgiving retreat, even though I call it living and dying with awareness, it's about understanding that. Sorry if I point. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I think we've gone long enough, and uh, so I think we'll bring this uh, uh, discussion to an end and get ready to have some meditation. Okay, so let's take a few minutes break to uh, do the needful, and we'll come back in a few minutes. That's a nice collage made up here. Who made that? Oh, it's beautiful. Prashant must have made this. I didn't know anybody was still listening. Very nice. Bhante, we couldn't listen to the talk this morning. Go to our YouTube, go to our uh, YouTube channel. And that's yes. up on our YouTube channel now. Yeah, ah, okay. We got locked down. I don't know why. Uh -huh. yeah? You came in late. Ah, okay, okay. YouTube and YouTube again. Oh, I think that's part of it. Uh, doing a few stretches before our meditation.
and just stand straight. <clears throat> Relax your shoulders and arms at the sides. <clears throat> Feel your feet pressing the floor. Feel the head balanced on top of the neck. You keep your chin raised up level to the floor. Gently close the eyes, just mentally feel the standing body <clears throat> and begin some three part breathing or deep, slow breathing, drawing the air from the lower lung up to the middle to the Feel that expansion in the upper chest. Hold the air in the lungs two or three seconds. Feel that subtle energy of oxygenation and the out breath. Just feeling the long relaxing out breath and feeling the last bit of air go out of the lungs. And then the next in breath. Centering the attention in the body. And you can open the eyes to observe as I lead you through these exercises. With the next in breath, raise the arms over the head, interlock the fingers, turn the palms up. Straighten the arms, stretch the head back, arch your lower spine a little bit. On the out breath, turn the palms down, touch the top of the head. And again, in breath, palms up, straighten the arms, stretch the head back, arch back. Out breath, touch the top of the head. And the third time, hold that upward stretch longer. Release the fingers and the out breath, arms back to the sides. Feel the sensations in the hands. Just feel the standing body. Just remember standing. Standing. Don't give the mind time to wander in thought. Body is always here and now, just beneath your nose. The next in breath, again, this time push up on the toes while raising the arms up over the head in this way facing the palms of the hands toward each other, six inches apart. Out breath, come back, arms to the side, heels back to the floor. Just feel the sensation. And in breath, up. Stretch. Out. In. Out. Relax. So you feel the increased heartbeat, pulsations. Some sensations, clothing touching the skin. 
any other body sensation. I just remember standing, standing, standing. Letting go of your thoughts. Let the thoughts come and go in the back of the awareness. Keep the feeling of the body in the front of the awareness. Next we'll do side bending using one arm at a time. So on the in breath, raise the left arm up. And keep your fingers and arms straight close to the head. On the out breath, bend over the right side. You keep your bicep muscle kind of touching the side of the head. In breath, lift up. Again, the same side, two more times, out breath. Let the other hand slide down by the knee. In breath, up. In out breath. In breath. In out breath, lower the arm. Next in breath, raise the other arm. The out breath, bend over the left side. In breath. Out. In. On the out breath, lower the arm. Relax, feel the whole body. Feet pressing the floor. The arms and hands at the side. Clothing touching the skin on different places. The head balanced on top of the neck. Just this body exactly as it is. Here and now, standing. 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 Life force vibrations going on. Okay, now let's uh, come back and get ready for you. The sitting awareness.
Okay, friends, so <clears throat> just try to get comfortable on your seat. I'm going to turn off the, my video. You can pay attention to the verbal instructions and keep focused on your own body and mind. So first of all, just focus your attention down to where the buttocks press the seat and feel that points of contact sense of hardness of pressure the buttocks pressing the seat just gently close the eyes it's like looking down through a microscope you feel that spot where the buttocks press the seat and feel the left buttock and the right buttock have different sensations. And let the awareness kind of move down the upper legs and around the knees, down into the feet. Feel your feet and toes. And they touch the floor, touch each other. Try to feel some sensation in your feet and toes. Just understand that this body is sitting. Now feel your hands touching together your fingers, you feel the outline of your thumbs and some fingers, the sensations, subtle sensations, your fingers and hands. And feel the weight of the arms hanging from the shoulders. Let the weight of the arms relax the shoulders. Just feel where the clothing rubs against the skin of the shoulders. Your upper arms. You just understand the sitting body. And gently kind of lift up the back and the spine to an erect posture to feel the natural inward curve of the lower spine that helps support the weight of the upper body. And then feel the head balanced on the top of the spinal column. You can imagine that it's a big head balanced on top of the Neck vertebrae, try to keep the chin lifted up level to the floor. And just mentally feel that erect but alert posture. Erect but alert. And feel some sensations on your face. Try to feel the skin stretched over the 
front of the skull, over the forehead, the nose, the chin. Feel those sensations, stretched skin, the prickling sensation. You feel your lips touching together, the upper lip touching the lower lip. You feel the dryness or the moisture. It's a different sensation. You feel the tongue laying in the mouth. You feel the, the teeth, the gums, the giving sensation. Just these raw body sensation. Just letting go of your thoughts or it's just coming back to focus on your body part. And feel the outer nose. There's a little prickling sensation in the outer nose. And focus inside the nostrils and see if you can feel the touch of air going in or out of the nostrils. You might take some slightly deeper breaths, feel that subtle touch sensation of the air. You might even hear the sound of the air moving through the nostrils. You just understand that this body lives off the air going in and out of the lungs and bloodstream. Thousands of times per day, air is moving in and out through the nostrils. But we never know it. Silent world of the inner body. Now feel the eyes resting in the sockets and the eyelids stretched over the eyeballs. You might see some light or color or some picture. You feel some subtle eye movement. Or just black darkness. Relax the eyes. Now from that point behind the eyes, <clears throat> let the awareness kind of just expand a little bit Try to feel the outline of the sitting body. Just 
get that general sense of the buttocks and feet pressing the floor beneath. The hands and arms, the sides in the center. Clothing touching the skin on different places. And the head balanced on top. Should be able to kind of see all those things almost in one glance. Observing a painting, but not as a visual image, it's just a collection of sensations. Sensations from the buttocks, feet, hands, arms, head, even the outline of what you call the body. The sitting body, that's a perception created in the mind from different sensations. Then tune more closely into the breathing process in the middle of that sitting body or take some deep, slow breaths to feel the more dynamic, expanding and contracting sensations in the middle of the body. You know the three part breathings, drawing the air from the lower lungs up through the middle to the top to feel that expansion in the upper chest, holding the air in the lungs a few seconds to allow all the oxygen to get into the bloodstream and feel the relaxing contraction of the out breath. Feeling the last bit of air go out of the lungs. Just try to continue that deep, slow breathing several more times, oxygenating the blood, helping to keep sitting straight. Cultivating this basic mindfulness. And breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, feeling the whole body. If you develop a more focused concentration, count the breaths from one to 10. On the next expanding in breath, mentally count one. You feel the pause, holding the air a moment, then the out breath. Count one. Next expanding in breath two. Repeat 
contracting out breath to me. Next in breath three. Out breath three. In breath four. Out breath four. In breath five. Out breath five. In breath six. Out breath six. In breath seven. Out breath seven. In breath eight. Out breath eight. In breath nine. Out breath nine. In breath ten. Out breath ten. And discontinue the counting. Discontinue any control. Deep breathing. Letting the breathing return to its uncontrolled rhythm. We continue to feel it, to observe it moment by moment. So we try to feel the subtler expanding and contracting sensations. Feel the Expanding the in-breath and the brief pause. Contracting out-breath and the brief pause. You simply know when the breath is coming in. And know when the breath is going out. You know it by feeling it. It's like looking through a microscope. Just turn up the power of the mental microscope to feel the subtler sensation expanding and contracting in the abdomen, rib cage, or chest. It's always changing, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. It's 
Try to get the feel of being a scientist sitting in the laboratory. This body is a laboratory. Looking down the microscope, which is through our consciousness. Look inside. Just make that the main focus of one's concentrated awareness. Just feeling the whole in breath from beginning to end and the brief pause. To feel the whole outgoing breath. In the brief pause, during the brief pauses, just remember and feel the sitting body. You're contemplating the body in the body, just feeling the body of breathing within the larger sitting body they're not really separate they're occurring simultaneously so just Continually remember, just breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting, this breathing body is the natural connection to the present moment. The basic definition of mindfulness is to remember, remember the present moment, starting with the breathing body, There's not much to remember. Breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. If you can remember how much money you have in the bank, you should be able to remember that you're sitting and breathing. But at the same time, be alert for thoughts or other hindrances sneaking up into the mind. Applying the appropriate right efforts, let go of those hindrances, apply the antidotes for weakening them. Always coming back to reconnect with the breathing. Just breathing in, sit Breathing out, sitting, breath by breath, moment by moment. Just 
it's developing applied and sustained thought, vitaka and vichara. Remembering, sitting and breathing. To feel, sitting and breathing. The different sensations constantly changing. In the brief pauses between the breaths, check your posture. The head is, chin is drooping down, the spine is slouching. Just take a deep, slow breath, straighten the body, spine, and head back to the erect and alert posture. Or if there's too many thoughts and drowsiness, do some more deep, slow breathing to charge the system up with oxygenated blood to help stay more awake and alert in the breathing body. Even while feeling, remembering, sitting and breathing, you can notice other sensations coming and going in around the body. Unpleasant sensations, biting, stinging sensations, pricking sensations, heat, stiffness, aches or pains. Just let all these different sensations just arise, come to a peak, change, vanish. Or maintaining that connection, breathing. And beneath all those irritating, painful sensations, monkey mind thought. Breathing is always there, going in and out. Just beneath your nose.
Try to notice subtler, more sensation. Coming and going, the breathing body. It's gradually opening up to the flow of impermanence. The rapidly changing sensation. Also, this mental activity in the mind, urges or wanting, and thoughts, trying to pull you away from the body. You get caught up in thinking, recognize it as thinking, thinking, or lost, lost. Take a deep breath, bring the mind back into the body. If the mind gets bored with this remembering, sitting, breathing, sitting, breathing, I recognize the five aggregates coming and going. This is material sensation, this is feeling, pleasant or painful feeling. This is perceptions and mental picture or image, recognition of an object. This is mental activity, thinking about it, reacting to it. This is the ego consciousness, thoughts of I, me, or mine. And just cultivating that chintamaya panya, that all of these five aggregates, these are not mine, not myself, not me, not mine, not myself. They're just 
conditioned phenomena created from the past, delusion, greed, hatred, and delusion, and ignorance. They're just impersonal phenomena arising and vanishing in the space of present moment awareness. That's the vipassana vision, seeing the Dhamma. Try to imagine that you're sitting in the balcony seat in the theater, just watching the movie of the body and mind. Just watching this body, just sitting and breathing, different aches and pains coming and going, different worries or thoughts or emotions coming and going in the mind. But just as you don't take a movie seriously, you don't take these five aggregates as me or mine or myself. Just the movie of karmic conditioning. All those quarrels or arguments or disagreements that you've had with family members or colleagues at work or other people, those are all just based upon our own attachments and clinging to you know, the opinions of I, me, and mine to just empty mental bubbles. You take them seriously and suffering arises. If you can see them with detached equanimity and even kind of chuckle at your clinging mistake. Easier to let go of them.
if you can just imagine this, you feel this body and mind like an empty house with nobody home to answer the call knocking at the doors and windows just the silent awareness the knowing Let the known and the knower fade out of the mind. Just let the pure knowing remain the vibration of awareness. suffering be free from suffering. May the fear struck be free from fear. May the grieving be free from grief. In this way may all beings live with mindfulness and wisdom. Thus spoke the Buddha. Well, as usual, let's spend the last couple of minutes of the meditation sending out thought vibrations of metta, friendliness, best wishes to our own five aggregate body and mind, all others.
Again, do some deep, slow breathing. And after taking a deep breath, expanding the lungs and chest, hold the air in the lungs as long as you comfortably can and try to feel those subtle sensations like metta just permeating the body, mind, nervous system. Feeling the relaxing contractions of the out breath. And after taking a few deep breaths like that in your own body and mind, imagine that's the metta going out to your own body and mind, wishing your body and mind to be peaceful, relaxed, imbuing it with pure love, pure energy, pure wisdom. And gradually, with the next in out breath, sending these waves of metta vibration to your parents, other family members, or friends, anybody you know is sick or having problems. Just with each out breath, just imagine these pleasant sensations, metta sensations going out permeating their body and mind, soothing the pains of their sufferings, awakening the seed of metta and wisdom in their hearts. Just with each out breath, just imagine these waves of metta going further and further outwards across the countryside, the city, the oceans and eventually around the whole earth and beyond. Just with each out breath, just tidal waves of metta just permeating the whole atmosphere. Just with the idea that may all living beings be free from greed, hatred, fear and ignorance free from the pains and sufferings of body and mind brought about by such unskillful thought, speech, and action. May all beings have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. May all beings be able to live peacefully and harmoniously together, understanding the ultimate interconnectedness and interdependence of all things. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. May all beings be well, peaceful, and one. It's like a mantra reverberating throughout space. Well, peaceful, and one. Yeah. We finish and invite you to chant the word sadhu three times on the out breath. So Oh.
Place your hands at the edges of the knees. Take one more deep breath. Stretch your head back with against the hands on the knees and arch backward. And lift your head up on an in breath. On the out breath, press the chin to the top of the chest. Stretch the neck vertebrae. Lift the chin up level on an in breath. Relax on the out breath. Put a smile on your face. Okay, friends, so that brings our afternoon session of meditation to an end. I hope you're all able to find some peaceful moments in that or some insights about your own body and mind. So, try to keep up your meditation during the week. On Wednesday, we're going to go over the Vattapala you know, Sutta and interesting suttas and the fun sutta, if you can see it that way. Okay, so I sent out the link to that. Uh, all right. Thank you, Buddha. Thank you, Buddha.